but I'm unmuted. Yes. I like best being unmuted. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Nice to see you all. Um, I'm also very excited about being here today. I, I used to teach an awful lot uh, to um, college juniors and seniors in seminars, and before that, I owned four training companies, but I haven't taught very much in the last couple of years, so this is exciting for me, especially in summertime. Um, let me share my screen with you here. And we'll be ready to get started. Okay, everyone see that? All right, I, um, I'm gonna depend upon you, Marshall, to help me with, uh, with the feedback from the students. Sure. Since I can only see about four or five of them right now for whatever reason that is. I can see all of them, so don't good, worry. Good, good, good. All right. Well, you let me know what, what's going on with if that. If anyone's crying, you will be the first to know. Good. Um, excellent. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time introducing myself today because I've got time next week, which Marshall already mentioned to you, uh, to go over a bit of my career, what uh, led me to the FBI, and how you might uh, join the FBI at some point in the future if that was something that you wanted to do. Uh, so I'll spend just a little bit of time giving you uh, some background. If you want more, you can read, read my bio, which... Uh, I wrote primarily for my mother because she's the only one that believes all those things that I actually put in it. Um, I, uh, I started with the federal government in 1965. For those of you that are not history majors, that's shortly after the Civil War. And uh, I spent uh, eight years in the Army and then 21 years in the FBI. And then uh, in 1995, I retired and um, began uh, doing what I'm doing right now, and that is teaching. Uh, first for a, uh, a so-called Beltway Bandit, a defense contractor, and then uh, a good friend of mine in the FBI and I opened up our own company. We began teaching first uh, employees uh, and, and professionals in the Central Intelligence Agency, and then we grew that program to um, all of the agencies in the intelligence community. Um, and, and I'll talk a little bit in a moment about um, about um, the program that, um, that you're going to be receiving today, where it came from and what the background is. But before I do that, uh, in addition to the stuff that, um, that um, Marshall and, um, and Lauren and, and Christina have prepared for you and put on your own uh, website, I've got a website as well. And, um, and it will be available to you since you're all my students now. Uh, for as long as I'm doing this stuff, and I plan to do it for a fair amount of time on into the future, um, for uh, resources. Uh, so the, the website is ctcitraining.org. That uh, is a, a contraction of counterterrorism, counterintelligence training partners, um, which is the name of, uh, of the company that I'm, I'm basically running right now. One part of that website and uh, the picture of the home page is on this particular slide. Uh, the fourth tab over is the student resource tab. It's the only one that's password, password protected. And in it, I have several years now, seven or eight at least, uh, years of reference data on intelligence, counterintelligence, uh, counterterrorism, and, uh, and security um, uh, subjects, topics, events, attacks, that sort of stuff, which has been helpful to some of my students over the years when they're writing papers and other things. In addition to that, if you uh, want to get in touch with me, if you've got a question after this is all over uh, next month or next year, uh, you can contact me through the website um, or you can contact me on my telephone, which is listed on this slide. Uh, happy to be of uh, help. Uh, and, you know, on any given day, I'm mentoring three or four uh, folks in either uh, college or graduate school in uh, national security subjects and, and national security careers. Um, I have a older son who's a lieutenant colonel uh, in the Army now in Army Special Operations Forces. Uh, he graduated from West Point in 2002, and uh, he just got back from his 15th deployment uh, to the Middle East. Uh, he is basically at the tip of the spear of what we do in counterintelligence against our adversaries around the world. My younger son is a deputy sheriff here in Rockbridge County, uh, Virginia, where I live. 
uh, Lexington, Virginia is the name of the town. And he's just finishing up the academy. He's been a deputy sheriff for about a year and a half now. All right. Uh, in addition to the student resource tab, there are a couple other things that I'll recommend to you. I know that one of them, uh, the counterintelligence officers, bibliography on terrorism, is a part of the materials that Christina put together for you. I'll mention the uh, intelligence officers bookshelf and annotated biography on intelligence subjects. Those, I think, are two very good bibliographies for you on the subjects of intelligence, counterintelligence, and counterterrorism uh, operations. So I would recommend, uh, recommend them to you. There's a fair number of books in each one of those bibliographies, um, but I start out in the uh, bibliography on terrorism by telling you the books that I think uh, that uh, maybe should rise to the top of that food chain. And I'll also, as we're getting into some of the things we're going to talk about this week and next week, I'll point out some books that I think are good references for the topics that I'll be, that I'll be speaking on. Well, my wife says I have no life, and you can tell by the last transition to this slide that that's probably true, uh, because I do spend a lot of time on, on slide transitions. It's interesting. I have done internet uh, training before. Uh, but not on these particular topics. So this is a this is a new experience for me, and um, I'm uh, I'm hopeful that um, that I can at least project my enthusiasm for the subject uh, on the internet uh, the same way I can do it if I was in the classroom, uh, able to look at your eyes and calibrate where your attention was at any particular time, and whether I needed to stop or go on, uh, and um, and continue with what I'm talking about. Anyway, so uh, this particular seminar uh, that we're going to have uh, spend the next couple of weeks together is going to really, uh, from my perspective and from the perspective of my colleague, Lynn Clark, who's a senior at the National Security Agency about ready to retire, something I did uh, 26 years ago, um, is, uh, is to talk to you about, um, at least today, to talk to you about um, uh, the intelligence and counterintelligence professions and explain to you uh, about how counterterrorism fits into those two professions, because I'll say it now and I'll say it again later on, it is not its own separate profession. It does not have its own separate trade draft. It is a subset of counterintelligence. And so as we look at counterintelligence trade craft, uh, I want you to make the transition that I'm, and I'll be making it several times before the two weeks are up, but I'm also talking about how we do things in, in counterterrorism operations as well. Today, we're going to set the stage. We're going to do some building block stuff. I have actually only one, thankfully, uh, pipe diagram to show you, uh, but the rest of the, the, the hour I'm going to spend with you is going to look at definitions and theories and laws that relate to these, uh, these professions, the professions of intelligence, uh, counterintelligence, and, um, and counterterrorism uh, operations. All right, so for a course description, if I was gonna describe the course to you, and it's pretty much the same description that I used when I taught this course uh, over about a seven year period to over 30 classes of intelligence professionals from all over the intelligence community, is to say to you that this is not about shoehorning you know half a day of training into two weeks uh with you this is more about deciding what we're going to drop out because we don't have time to focus on it so if you feel like at any time during my presentation that you are downstream on a fire hose of information it's designed to be that way my goal is to show you how complex these disciplines are i don't expect you to take everything that i say to you away and understand it, although I hope you'll understand most of it, I'm sure you will, or, or apply it, uh, because quite frankly, it took me 19 years to get to the point where I could apply all of the things that I'm gonna talk to you about, uh, the real world stuff that's part of how you do this intelligence, counterintelligence, counterterrorism operations stuff, um, that, um, that uh, a lot of people that are doing it have not set through uh, the classes that you're going to you're going to be getting, but okay, so so it's intensive without question. It's going to be non-linear. Although if I were going to spend a lot of time with the evolution of terrorism, I would try to make it linear. Uh, it's not going to be linear. I'm going to bounce around. I'm going to bounce around to different subjects in uh, different orders 
uh, that I think will make the most sense to you for the amount of time that we're going to spend together this week. Uh, and in those subjects, we're going to be considering strategy, tactics, definitions, patterns, and lessons learned. I'm going to show you a fair number of terrorist attacks. You've already had a chance to look at um, one of the modules that I teach to intelligence and counterintelligence professionals, as well as my uh, college uh, classes of juniors and seniors in the seminar, and that's the class on the anatomy of a terrorist attack. The goal of that, and we'll talk more about that on Wednesday when I'll go over that with you in some detail, the goal of that is to give you an idea of how complex terrorist operations are from the point of view of the terrorist organization conducting the attack. And, um, and uh, hopefully uh, the things that those videos discussed with you uh, gave you that impression. That was the design. So we're going to try to look at some of the terrorist attacks and learn from them. Um, and we're going to try to apply the things that we learned into um, uh, countermeasures for our partners in Nigeria to make uh, their job in protecting Yobi State University uh, more successful, protect the students there, and as Marshall said, to save lives. Now, what you're going to see, I don't want to take a breath here for a second, is um, it is with me is um, is drawn from this five day 40 hour uh, course that I taught intelligence community professionals uh, over a thousand of them uh, over th that period of time called practical perspectives on counter terror operations. Now it is a class not on the evolution of terrorism. I taught that also, but not in this particular um, this particular framework. It's a class on how you respond to terrorism, how you run operations against terrorist groups. And that's kind of what we're gonna be focusing on. Um, told you it's been given over 30 times uh, to uh, intelligence community audiences, as well as uh, law enforcement audiences from, from police departments all over the United States at all levels, uh, local, state, and federal uh, levels of, of law enforcement. So, so what you're seeing it's not only based upon the years that I did it as a street agent in the FBI, but it's also based upon years of study and years of actually teaching it to audiences and getting their responses back in the discussions during the class and their feedback after the class. Uh, so I want you to get the sense that this particular product that you're going to be giving is not being run out of the garage for the first time. It's been around for a while and has been proven effective. Now, this is what we designed the course to do. First of all, the beginning of knowledge is recognizing, admitting that you don't know something. So this course is gonna help you understand that what you uh, don't know about counterterrorism tactics and tradecraft. Now I'll say again what I said a couple paragraphs ago, a lot of the professionals that I talked to, <coughs> pardon me, even those that have been doing this kind of stuff in the street, um, saw things in this particular class that changed their thinking, that changed their understanding of their profession. So, um, so there's going to be some stuff in here that is going to have um, that level of currency, that level of, um, of accuracy about it. We want to assist you in the process of pattern analysis. One of the things that human beings do better than any other living thing on the planet is being able to look at stuff assimilate stuff and, and analyze it and come up with patterns of behavior. The only way you can be an adversary, if you're in the counterterrorism business, is beat them first mentally. The only way you can do that is know about them, understand them, see the things that they've done in the past, analyze uh, the things that they've done in the past, and develop patterns so that you can respond ahead of them uh, to the attacks that they're crafting against you. The thing about terrorist groups is they get to make all the primary choices. They get to decide who they're going to attack, when they're going to attack them, what kind of attack they're going to make. And, and we in the counterterrorism business, the counterintelligence business, the security business, as our partners in Nigeria are in, have to recognize that we only get to make secondary choices and, and we have to be ready to react. And the only way we can do that successfully is to understand. Uh, some of the things that have gone on in the past and apply them to the present. 
We want to stimulate you to develop your own knowledge base, insights, and truths about Tara. All Tara, I used to say to my students, to every class I've ever taught, that all the truth is not in the front of the room. I'll say to you that all the truth is not on the current monitor that you're watching me on. Uh, some of the truth is going to be from other people that you're going to meet and listen to this week. Some of the truth is going to come after you've had some discussions, after you've had uh, you know, some of the stuff that you've seen internalized. But it's going to be truths that are true for you. It's not my job in life to tell you what true is. Uh, it's your job to design it uh, or to, 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 to determine it for yourself. Now, speaking of truth, it's at this point I would ask you uh, for what you think the definition of historical truth is. A lot of the questions that I'm going to ask are going to be rhetorical questions because of this particular platform and because of the time that we have to go over some of this stuff. So many of the answers that I would get if I waited for you to answer the question would be that, well, uh, the first draft of history is the media and the newspapers. The truth is written by the winners. Uh, there is the, the, uh, the great man and woman theory of history. That means that history is, it, it becomes history because of the actions of great men and women. There is the great event. Uh, theory of history that says history is history because events control our actions and we don't have much control ourselves. I'll tell you now what Rusty's definition of historical truth is. And none of the things that I have said to you up to this point should be written down, but maybe you want to think about internalizing this because I think this will help. This certainly helps as we're bombarded with all of the versions of the truth that we get in the media today and from our friends in the day, and from our families today. Um, my definition of the truth, and I have used this for about, about 30 years now, and I'm still comfortable with it, so that's kind of the test for me. If I'm still comfortable with something, I've been using it for that long. I, I, I have not seen anything that causes me to change my mind. Here it is. The truth is, the average of all of the primary and secondary sources that you can avail yourself of, that you can read, that you can listen to on a particular subject. Now, interestingly, a lot of people think that the world and the experiences that we have in the world um, can be defined in absolute truths. Some people would say that, no, that's not true, that truths are kind of gray and we have to compromise on the truth. Um, my experience is that if you can read a lot of stuff, and you can waddle, watch a lot of stuff. And I look at probably each day at least 30 different sources, newspapers, news reports. Um, I subscribe to uh, several online intelligence services that provide me with data. Um, uh, if you can look at a lot of stuff, and then if you can average it out, you'll have an opportunity to come close to what the historical truth is. But, but to explain that even better, in my career in the FBI, I probably went to 85 bank robberies because FBI agents get a call on the radio, there's a bank robbery in downtown Lexington and all agents that get that call that are in the vicinity call into the control and say that they're responding to the bank robbery. Every single bank robbery I went to, we would interview at that bank robbery, four or five to 25 witnesses to the truth that happened in the same space of time um, and, and guess how many versions of the truth that we got when we looked at the reports of those eyewitnesses to that same event in time. If we interviewed 12, there would be 12 versions of the truth. And that's the reason why the truth is so difficult to get to. And that's why I, I use that particular discussion. And that's why I think it's so important to avail yourself of as much information as you can from as many sources. I read, I read um, several foreign newspapers each day for the same reason. So I recommend that definition to you and I recommend the idea of, um, of, uh, of having several different sources, regardless of what your political viewpoint is. Uh, remember what I said earlier, if you wanna beat your adversary, you have to beat him first mentally. To do that, you have to know what your adversary is thinking, what they might do. So, so uh, reading, um, um, you know, media reports from papers that you don't agree with. I, I for instance, I, I, I read Al Jazeera. I sometimes watch Al Jazeera. Uh, I'm, um, I'm a regular reader of the Manchester Guardian called now the UK Guardian. I read um, 
you know, the Times, I read, uh, I read the Washington Post, I subscribe to the Hoover Institute. Uh, and if you know anything about those different, um, those different uh, sources of information, you would know that they come from the various parts of our political spectrum. All right, I want to take a breath. Marshall, should I take a breath? Should we ask if there's a question or two that maybe any of this is prompted? Yes, does anyone have a question for Rusty? Raise your hand if you do. Dom, you can ask a question here. I'm going to unmute you. Ask yeah. your question. Okay, so you said for like finding the truth, you like to look at all the sources. And I was wondering, so like, would you also recommend looking at all of these like far right sources or far left sources? Do you think they're also harboring some truth or are they really just radicalizing or just kind of lying, I guess, to prove their point? Okay, so that's a great question. And I definitely would recommend you look at them because, um, because they are, if they, if they rise to the level of half truths, um, I would be surprised. But you need to know what uh, the extremes are saying because we don't have problems with um, the average members of right wing or left wing or liberal or conservative groups, uh, religious groups. Where we have the problems in terrorism is on the fringes of those groups and uh, the fanatics that sometimes are kicked out of those groups. So would I recommend that you, um, that you read that stuff? Yeah, I would, Dominic. I, th I think it's a value to know. It falls into that same category about knowing your adversary, uh, whether, you, whether you believe in it or not. And some of it I think is important, important to know because you need to get some sense of how far out uh, some of these claims and some of these comments are. Good question. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else have a question for Rusty? This time with the FBI, what he's talking to you about right now. Everyone's feeling good? Good. That gave me a chance to have a drink and take a breath um, and, and lower my enthusiasm level just a little bit. All right. So we're going to move on now to, um, to how the FBI begins cases. And this gets into um, the question about, um, um, you know, the, the rights that we have as citizens in this, um, in this democracy that we live. When can the FBI begin a counterintelligence case? Because it's a big deal. When the FBI opens up a case on Rusty Caps, Rusty Caps' life is never going to be the same again, okay? When we open it up on Marshall Bailey, his life's going to change forever. So we don't want to open that kind of a case um, willy nilly. We want to be, um, we want to have some guidelines on, on what sort of things we need to know before we turn the bright light of the government and the FBI on one of our, one of our citizens. And, and that's described in the FBI file that will start on Rusty Caps and the first piece of paper in that file, which is called Serial One. On Serial One, it will document the things that caused the FBI to open this case. Was it a witness coming forward and saying they saw Rusty walk into the Russian embassy uh, on Mount Alto in Washington, D.C.? Was it someone that said they saw Rusty at a meeting of this group of, uh, of people that are considered uh, to be right-wing terrorists, a part of the alt-right? Whatever it was, it's going to be in that first serial and it's going to be a record, it's going to be part of the history of Rusty and the FBI and therefore lawyers, the ACLU and everyone else to see. So, so what's required? First of all, um, I'm going to spend not long, but just a short amount of time talking about probable cause and the reasonable person, the reasonable person theory. That talks about um, a piece of information that would be probable cause to believe that Rusty had done something untoward and it would pass the reasonable person test. And that is that, that, that a, a reasonable person would look at this and agree that Rusty ought to be uh, recognized. It's not in statute as much as it's a legal fiction that says that based upon English common law five, 600 years ago, um, uh, it was reasonable to believe that that, um, that doing this sort of thing, whatever it is, um, would cause the government and the FBI uh, to be concerned and give them the authority to open up first um, the, the least intrusive of all FBI investigations, the 90-day preliminary inquiry. 90 days, this case on Rusty is going to be open. 
to check it out and see if there's any validity to the claim that was made um, or uh, the event that was observed or whatever the, the initial uh, cause of the case in the beginning. What types of things can the FBI do during this 90 day preliminary period? Not much. Uh, we can check all the records in the FBI. We can do one outside the FBI records check and we can go interview Rusty. And uh, if we haven't found anything in any of those areas that causes us to move to the second level, then we close down the preliminary inquiry and it just goes and sits in a file somewhere. Uh, but if we did find that there's some reason uh, to move forward, then we would go to the dreaded FBI full field investigation. Now in that investigation, you can do basically anything that you want to do that doesn't require a court order. Uh, you can surveil Rusty. You can check any of the agencies that are out there, other government agencies. You can check in, on social media. Uh, you can go to Rusty's neighbors and interview Rusty's neighbors. Uh, whatever you want to do once you've moved to this full field investigation can be done unless it requires the one higher level of authority uh, that's required of searches and wiretaps. Um, and, and, you know, electronics, all types of electronic over here and that sort of stuff. So that gives you a sense of how you would move down the food chain uh, to open up an FBI case on a counterterrorism subject uh, for the, for, from our point of view uh, during this week. Now, as I kind of indicated earlier, this can be, this can be problematic because you're messing with civil liberty of rusty. And every time you open up an FBI case on anyone, um, then, uh, then that same sort of thing can happen. What if it got out? Uh, the FBI's files are not available to the media. The FBI is not supposed to talk to the media. I mean, uh, I can tell you that as an FBI agent, the only thing I worried about more than talking to the media was losing my badge and credentials and my gun. I mean, one of the things that was impressed upon us almost from day one in new agent training is that you don't talk to the media. Um, and, and we have you know, public relations officers in the FBI that do that on a regular basis, but the average agent is not supposed to do that. Now, if you, if you look at police departments, you'll see police departments, police officers talking to the media all the time. Not supposed to happen in the FBI. That's why, um, that's why when it does happen, like those of you that know anything about history and Watergate and um, and the source that Woodward and Bernstein had inside the FBI was, um, was uh, such an aberration. Um, he was actually the number two guy in the FBI, Mark Feld, but he was so distressed about what happened uh, following Watergate and the attempts by President Nixon to subvert the FBI investigation um, that, he, um, that he contacted um, uh, members of the media. Unusual, very unusual. All right, so the delicate balance that I'm talking about here is the balance between security and civil liberties. Generally, in America, we believe that convenience is more important than security. I mean, in Israel, we don't believe that. Uh, and uh, on Israeli, if you, want to, if you want to fly on the safest airline that's only been hijacked once in its history, El Al, uh, you have to put up with about, anyone flown El Al? You have. Well, Marshall, I should let you tell people how long you have to wait in line to get aboard the aircraft, right? You have to stand with your, you have to stand with your bags um, and, and they're, they're, go ahead. I was say, I lived in Gosh Etzion, uh in 2003. Uh, and then I flew back uh, before I, so I was doing international development work for uh, parliament in South Africa. And I had to fly there and back and forth. And they literally took apart my computer. I'm, yeah. They, they took me to a side room because my computer was from like 2000 and those, you know, they're big and clunky. They took apart the battery. Um, they put it back together for me, but they took me to a side room, asked me every question. They asked, I was, I'm not Jewish. They wanted to know why I was there, why I wanted to learn about the community. I was, um, just to give everyone a little background, I, I was doing a work in South African parliament and apartheid had ended. And the South African government was interested in a potential apartheid conditions in Israel. So I was staying on the West Bank monitoring uh, 
go-betweens interactions between uh, the Palestinians um, and Israelis uh, on the West Bank. So I was living in one of their communities for a while. And they were, they literally asked me everything that they could possibly ask me about my life. Uh, they, they knew where I grew up. They knew what hospital I was born in and they quizzed me on it. It's a very weird situation. <laughs> Um, and it was partially because I was there for the uh, South African government is why I assumed I got all the additional questioning. But yeah, I was in a room, I, had, I arrived two and a half hours early. And I was in a room for, I want to say 45 minutes to an hour where they just did everything. Is that, Rusty, is that normal? Or is it just because- Oh, no, it's absolutely normal. As a matter of fact, yeah. if, if, you, if you took, if it took any less than three hours for you to board the aircraft, that would be unusual. And by the yeah. way, if they don't like the look of you, you don't fly. If they don't like the look of you, you sit in the back next to an Israeli sky marshal. Uh, because why? Well, because they take security seriously. And for them, inconvenience doesn't matter because they know that their lives, the lives of all the people on the aircraft and the lives of Israelis around the world are at risk every single day. So, so, so Rusty, real quick question. How many people are armed on those flights? Uh, more than you think. <laughs> it, it, depends upon, it depends upon which aircraft, too. I mean, which airline? Okay. Um, and and the, the third answer to that is I don't even know anymore uh, because I've been away from the game for so long. But um, but uh, yeah, there's a there's a fair number of them in in the um, in the main cabin as well as on the flight deck, um, especially especially in airlines that um, that that have greater threats like El Al does. That's good. Th thanks, Marshall. That, that's really helpful. That makes my point. Okay, so, so some countries don't think of um, uh, security as an inconvenience. We think of it as an inconvenience. Now, the closer we are to the last terrorist attack, guess what? We're willing to accept more security uh, than we would the farther away we get from that last terrorist attack. I mean, none of, none of you, young, young ladies and gentlemen, were you know, there at or watched on TV, probably uh, the attacks on 9-11. But for many Americans um, at your age during that time or adults, uh, older adults during that time, um, that changed the way that they looked at their country, that changed the way they looked at their government. Their government could not, could no longer seemingly protect them. And so for a time, uh, even up until the day, many of the security measures, at least at airports, are still uh, still in place. We prefer civil liberties over safety. Um, but my question to you is: What if we? Uh, what if our media, media? What if our leaders become so afraid of terrorism uh, that they choose more and more security over civil liberties? I mean, it's a slippery slope, and, and it's not the terrorist that would cause. The United States to cease to exist, but our reaction to terrorism uh, that went too far in the direction of security could easily uh, cause um, cause the the republic that we know today uh, to be changed irreparably. So so it's always important. I mean, when, when you're thinking about this stuff, you think about the delicate balance, the balance between the rights of citizens in this country to feel secure and the rights of citizens in this country to enjoy all the civil liberties that are guaranteed by the Constitution and that you want to have uh, in your everyday lives. Not, not an easy task. Um, are you freer now than before 9-11? The answer is no, you're not freer. You're, you're less free. Any of you flown before the coronavirus? Let me see a, a thumbs up or a clap. Have flown on airlines in the last, uh, in the last year? Okay. So, so remember taking off your shoes? Remember taking off your belts? Um, those are all invasions of civil liberties. It doesn't say in the Constitution that Americans, that the government of the United States can do that uh, to Americans. But the TSA is the government of the United States and are being intrusive, and you don't object to it because you can see the reason behind it. Um, kind of reminds me of the argument we're having right now uh, in the media over to wear or to not wear the mask and how much should the government get into that? Um, it's interesting, interesting. All right, so we talked about this delicate balance. These are the freedoms, the basic, uh, the basic civil rights that I'm talking about that tend to be diminished 
when security concerns, um, you know, uh, raise uh, their their head. Um, and and you know, think about it for a second. What's the coronavirus done to the civil liberties that are on this particular slide? I mean, you and your lives can probably tick off four or five or six of these civil liberties that have been dramatically impacted because of the coronavirus. So the, so the scale is swinging again now, not because of a terrorist. Well, you know, the virus is pretty terrifying, but it's not, as we get to the definition of terrorism, it ain't, it ain't terrorism. Unless we can, of course, prove that it was in fact a, uh, a, uh, a, 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 an attack by a foreign country that did this on purpose, which we're not gonna be able to prove, I'm quite certain. All right, so you've had a chance to look at that. Let's go back even farther a little bit and talk about ethical consideration because that's what I'm, I'm wanting us to kind of wrap all this in. The government has an ethical responsibility. The FBI has an ethical responsibility. I, as an FBI agent, had an ethical responsibility to ensure that I was not exceeding my brief, to ensure that I was not taking away civil liberties uh, that should not be taken away. And I mean, when I, when I say, you know, raise, stop, raise your hands, freeze, FBI, and put handcuffs on you, your civil liberties just went south in a very big way. So that's, that's the, the extreme, um, you know, that's the extreme that I'm talking about here with regards to FBI investigations, because quite frankly, if we're doing a terrorism investigation, um, our main goal is to stop the terrorist attack, our second goal is to put the terrorist or the terrorist group in jail, to arrest them, to take them off the playing field. All right, so you've had a chance to read Nikolai Machiavelli, and, and Machiavelli you know, says that it doesn't really matter what means you use if your end is good. So if I've got this idea about this new society that I wanna create, uh, and it's good, and I'm convinced it's good, and I'm convinced I'm right, it doesn't matter what means I use to put it into place. Uh, people like, let's see, uh, Lenin, Stalin, Mao, um, you know, and, 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 and Hitler and Mussolini and other totalitarian um, uh, dictators would argue to uh, the, their last breath that Machiavelli had it right. And, and what they were going to eventually end up with would have been better for you and you would have loved it because they knew that what they were talking about was right. Okay, so, so let's kind of translate that to, uh, to where we are, uh, to, to closer to us today in this country. Read this. I'll give you a couple of seconds to read this. And, um, and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna see if you're, if you're gonna be surprised by who wrote it. Do you think at all that this is similar to what Machiavelli was saying? How about um, the law of necessity of self-preservation or of a higher obligation to lose our country by scrupulous adherence to the written law would be to lose law itself and life, liberty and property and all those things who all those who are enjoying them with us, thus sacrificing the ends of the means. So, so what whoever this author is is saying is that you know the situation could get so rough that we're going to have to take measures that will protect the the experience, the experiment that this nation represents. Now, this is who wrote it, uh, who's not someone you consider to be in Machiavelli's camp at all, I'm pretty sure. He was a small government guy, not a big government guy. But, um, but he's, he's pointing out that like we're facing today during the coronavirus, it may be necessary to give up some of the civil liberties that we have in order to preserve 
the lives of our countrymen and and the experiment the experiment called the United States of America. Okay, so let's let's take this and 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 translate it into the real world and see how another country, the United Kingdom, responds to a series of very deadly terrorist attacks. I'm only going to show you one of them um, in in the United Kingdom and what their first blush solution to it was, which I think is important to uh, keep in mind. This attack took place in 2017, so it's not that old. It was a, um, a driving attack um, that ended up um, um, with the terrorist himself in the, on the grounds of the Palace of Westminster, which is where Parliament is. Uh, but before he got there, he crossed Westminster Bridge and, um, and drove over uh, uh, quite a number of people uh, and then eventually uh, killed a police officer with a knife before he was uh, dispatched by an armed police officer, which is an unusual occurrence in the United Kingdom. Uh, most police in the United Kingdom do not carry weapons, uh, but they do have armed police officers for just such occasions around buildings like Parliament, as you can imagine, that are targets. All right, this is, this is um, a, um, a video that was created by The Guardian that'll kind of, kind of give you a better sense than my words will give you of what the attack was like to the people who were on the bridge, uh, who were on the streets, who experienced it first person personally. So I took some pedestrians out and they were just laying there and then the whole crowd just surged around the corner just by the gates just opposite the big bend. Never seen anything like that. Tomorrow morning, Parliament will meet as normal. We will come together as normal. And Londoners and others from around the world who have come here to visit this great city will get up and go about their day as normal. They will live their lives. And we will all move forward together, never giving in to terror and never allowing the voices of hate and evil to drive us apart. Okay, Prime Minister Theresa May, um, and that, that gives you a sense, that's a first look at a terrorist attack. It gives you a sense of, of what it might be like to be on the street. I've never been in a terrorist attack. Any of you have ever been in a terrorist attack? No, I don't think so. Okay, good. I have been in combat. I have been the victim of an armed robbery. I have had a gun pushed in my face, so I get some sense. I have some sense of what that feels like. Uh, but um, but you could see, looking at and listening to the reactions of the people on the street, how much trauma is associated with this. And the trauma goes on well beyond the attack itself because of the media. Now, there's all kinds of arguments about what role the media should play, and we're not going to get into that. But it's a it's an interesting, a very interesting discussion. What responsibility do they have? The media knows that they are a tool of the terrorists. 
but they're unable to um, they're unable to almost do anything about it because uh, because it plays it plays so well on television. But let's go back to um, let's go back to the attack of the United Kingdom and talk about um, the government's response. Uh, derogation or relaxation of the rule or law concerning basic human rights is, uh, is, is kind of the discussion we've been having for the last five or six minutes. Uh, the major goal of terrorist attacks is to cause governments to overreact. Now I ask you, is this an overreaction on the part of Theresa May and the British government uh, when, uh, when, well, sorry about that. I got way too excited. When she, makes the, when she makes this comment. If our human rights laws get in the way of doing it, of tracking terrorist suspects, because they're having difficulty getting the necessary authorities to break into these, um, these, uh, the, the rights of British citizens, then we'll change the law so we can do it. And of course, um, her opposite number in, in, uh, in Parliament said, uh, the UK would have to declare a state of emergency to change human rights laws, and um, and um, and and that's that's typically what what governments do. Now, um, I, I missed a question that I wanted to ask you, and it's important uh, because uh, throughout the next two weeks, we're going to try to understand how dangerous terrorism is to nations. And so, my question is: Is terrorism an existential threat to the United States and to the West? It, make that one question. It's U.S. And, and the West, is it an ex existential threat? Is our existence threatened? And um, if, you, if you think that our existence is threatened, how about let me see some sign, maybe that hand. So, was. Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, everyone who thinks our existence is threatened, just raise your hand and keep it up so Rusty can see. It's okay. If, Okay, okay. Hi. So, so I'm, I, what I'm saying, what I'm, what I'm thinking is that most of you believe that terrorism does not pose an existential threat to the United States or to any of the countries in the West. Has terrorism ever brought down a government? And that's raise your hand if you think terrorism has ever brought down a government. <laughs> terrorism has. Okay. All right. And, and for those of you that didn't, didn't, well, most of you think that it has, and you'd be correct. Terrorism has brought down uh, a government, uh, the government of Spain, after the, uh, after the attacks on their, um, their, their, uh, their trains, their, their uh, trains uh, that uh, um, were, uh, were bringing uh, employees and other personnel into, into Madrid uh, several years ago. All right. So uh, let's let's go on. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time with that. It's, they're interesting. They're interesting discussions, but we need to kind of move forward and kind of wrap up with a few definitions. Why do we do these things that we're talking about? Intelligence, counterterrorism, counterintelligence, and security um, to construct a protected environment where we and our most important creation ideas can flourish. Um, we do counterterrorism, we do counterintelligence, we do intelligence to protect our citizens, our facilities, to protect our country. And, and to the extent that we're successful, we, in talking about terrorist attacks, we preempt and disrupt them before the bomb goes off. We're much more concerned with, and it's a much higher goal to do that, than it is to have the bomb go off and then catch and try the terrorists and put them in jail. I don't think any of you, I think all the classes I've ever taught, um, all the students I've ever taught, no one has ever come up to me and said, Rusty, you know, um, I disagree with you when you say that you would allow all 19 of the um, hostage takers on 9-11 to go free if you could have stopped those four airlines from being hijacked and the three airlines from flying into the Pentagon and the towers of the World Trade Center. I mean, the whole purpose of what we should be about is stopping the bomb before it takes, before it goes off. And so, so when we're good at doing it, uh, no one knows about it most of the time. When we fail at, at, at constructing an, at this environment, when the environment breaks down, these are the types of things that we have to deal with. Pearl Harbor, perfect example. 
the Japanese Navy should have been uh, found on its way. The aircraft should have been, uh, actually they were seen on radar as they're approaching um, the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, the, the, uh, the atomic bomb uh, should have been protected and the Russians should have not gotten access to the Manhattan Project. Uh, this, uh, this particular picture down here at the bottom focuses on the hostage that were taken in Tehran in 1979. And then, of course, the 9-11 attacks, and that's Mohammed Atta. Those are all failures on the part of intelligence and counterintelligence, the professions that uh, I was involved in for much of my career. Sorry. OK, just so you see this, and so you know that the US intelligence community is a very complex animal. Uh, Marshall has several people from various aspects of it that are going to come and talk to you the various uh, in the next uh, in the next couple of weeks about the agencies that they work for. I'll talk to you about the FBI next week uh, for a short amount of time. Um, interesting point. Before this Reform Act took place, there were 15 members of the U.S. intelligence community. After it took place, there were 18. And yet, one of the books that I'm going to recommend you have in your library at some point, the 9-11 Commission Report, that commission that was put in place to look at and suggest to the government things that we did wrong that caused 9-11 um, to take place, the 9-11 Commission said there are too many members of the intelligence community. There's too much redundancy. You're not sharing information enough. So what does the government do in reorganizing? We add three more intelligence organizations to the picture. Does that make sense to anybody um, at all? No, it shouldn't. It's, uh, but it's what the government does. When the government faces crisis, the thing that it does best is reorganize and spend money. I can't tell you how many billions of dollars were spent on new command centers and new SCIFs. The SCIF is a, is a is a highly protected room where you can go into it and you can talk about top secret stuff and it can't be penetrated by any sort of uh, outside listening capabilities. Billions and billions of dollars. The intelligence community alone uh, after 9-11 mushroomed from people that had top secret clearances from about 400,000 to well over a million. So um, give you a sense of, uh, are we able to do it better today than before? I think not because less is always more. Um, simple is always a better way to go uh, than having more, but that gives you a sense of. Now, the other thing that's interesting here about this uh, diagram is that you see in the middle of it, the director of national intelligence, do you think he's in or she's in, whenever there's a lady in charge there, are in charge of intelligence in the United States? You would think so, right? The director of national intelligence ought to be in charge of national intelligence, right? No, not in the United States. You only get to be in charge of anything in the government of the United States if you control the budget. Marshall's in charge of leadership initiative because on his little watch and his little hand and his little mouse controls the budget for LI. But I guarantee you, the director of national intelligence doesn't control the budget for uh, the secretary of defense, doesn't control the budget for the FBI, or the attorney general or the state department. So dotted lines, how, how, how much, how much, control can you exercise with a dotted line? Well, not much, I can assure you. For after 40 years in the government, I know pretty sure. All right, so some definitions real quickly. Uh, defining intelligence. The intelligence is the capacity to acquire, to analyze, and disseminate information on a timely manner to leaders to assist in the decision-making process. To get, to analyze, and to give to our leaders in this country information so they can make decisions in other than a deaf, dumb, and blind state. Now, do they listen to the intelligence that they get? Is the intelligence always right? No and no. But, but if you don't have an intelligence service giving you information, then you know, your ability to make good decisions is going to be seriously harmed. The mission of an intelligence service. Now, it's essentially the same thing, but notice the nuanced difference to collect, to analyze, and distribute intelligence to senior policymakers and conduct covert operations. Covert operations, what are they? When my son, my oldest son, uh, and his organization uh, goes somewhere and grabs someone that's a terrorist that we don't like off the street and render him back to the United States to be tried here. That's a covert operation. 
when when someone decides to use a predator drone and a hellfire missile to take out a pickup truck driving a terrorist leader in 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 Yemen that's a covert operation all covert operations has to be approved by the president of the united states but but the bottom line for the mission of intelligence service is when you've distributed your intelligence your day is done you got to collect it you got to analyze it and distribute it to policymakers and then the other thing that, that the CIA does and the military do are covert operations. FBI doesn't do doesn't do very many covert operations. I've never heard of an FBI covert operation, but perhaps there are some. All right, so terror groups know what the definition of intelligence is, and they know how important it is. Uh, in the Al-Qaeda training manual that was grabbed in a safe house in Manchester, England, <coughs> before 9-11, I forget what year, 97 or 98. Um, it had how they do stuff. I'm gonna show you some of that as the week progresses, some other things that relate to, to surveillance, is what, how they say surveillance is supposed to get, do, do, be done. But the Al-Qaeda training manual says that winning the battle is dependent upon knowing the enemy's secrets, movements, and plans. Okay, well, someone else said that about 25 centuries ago. So they've read Sun Tzu, which is what I'm gonna show you in a moment. And I suggest you read Sun Tzu as well, because Sun Tzu knew a little bit about that as well. I think I don't get to Sun Tzu until Thursday, though. All right, counterintelligence. We talked about intelligence. Counterintelligence, you know, as the name implies, counterintelligence is about countering the ability of adversary services or terrorist groups to collect intelligence about you. Uh, when we get into operation security, Lynn Clark is going to talk to you about looking at yourself from the point of view of an adversary. So you can see what the adversary sees when they look at you and make changes based upon that. But, but counterintelligence by way of things that they do, they identify, they deceive, they exploit, they disrupt or protect against these sorts of threats. Espionage, other intelligence activities by foreign intelligence services, sabotage, we haven't had any of that since World War I in the United States, or assassinations conducted foreign behalf, foreign powers, organizations, persons, or their agents, anybody that comes from a foreign country to do that kind of collection is in the definition of what counterintelligence is, or international terrorist activities. So here it is in the definition, this is an executive order, the definition of the President of the United States, that counterterrorism is a subset of counterintelligence. So I could show you laws as well, but just take my word for it. Counterterrorism is not its own profession. It is a subset of counterintelligence. I've, I can't tell you how many people I've talked to in the military that think that counterterrorism is its own profession, but it, it, it ain't, sorry. All right. Okay, so the relationship, continuing this thought, between counterintelligence and counterterrorism, uh, terrorism isn't new. Counterterrorism is not a separate new discipline. I said that in several different ways, uh, but I'm going to reiterate it this one last time, probably, that it's, uh, it uses the same tradecraft, but it's not, and is a subset of counterintelligence. So why is there terrorism in the world today, do you think? Rusty asks, not exactly rhetorically, and of course the answer is because it works. Because it works, and it's worked for literally thousands of years. And, and we'll listen to a former Israeli terrorist, actually a former Jewish terrorist uh, that operated against the British when, when Israel was not a state, when it was a, the Palestinian mandate. He's gonna talk to you on this specific subject. And I want you to listen to him because he's gonna explain it better than I could ever explain it. I've never been a terrorist, he has. I chased terrorists, but I've never, never been one. Okay, why so much attention to terrorism? Do you think it's because it's so deadly? Those of you that most of you don't think it's an existential threat, but but why does the media pay so much attention to it? Because it's so deadly. I don't think so. More people are killed on the U.S. highways every year. You already know how many people are killed on the highways every year on average. Forty thousand, forty to fifty thousand, and you don't know about that. Why? Because it's boring because it's been that way every year. The media doesn't report it anymore because it doesn't have what the media needs and the media to lead, it's gotta bleed. You've heard of that, right? If it bleeds, it leads. Well, it doesn't bleed. 
because it's such an important event. It affects the lives of so many people. Well, it affects your lives dramatically. It has and affected them more closer to 9-11, but it still it affects your lives. I mean, we talked about your members of the flying public and what that's like. Well, if that's the case, is it more important than the economy, world hunger, the environment? And you'd say, no, it absolutely is not. So why is there so much attention on terrorism? Well, uh, it gets a lot of media coverage. Is the media the mother of terror? Would there be terrorism if there were no media? Well, I don't know, but, but is, does it get more attention than the election is gonna get in November and the time leading up to November? Does it get more attention to the collapse of the economy in 2008? Does it get more attention than the COVID-19 pandemic? I don't know if anything's gonna get more attention than that. So, so it's, it's, it's not for these types of reasons. So if it's none of these reasons, what do you think it is? Why does the media so interested in it? And the truth is because it plays so well in color, in living color, in high definition TV. I mean, when I show you that picture, and there was no blood in, in, in the, the short spot of media from The Guardian that I showed you, there was no blood in that, but a lot of the terrorist coverage, especially the foreign terrorist coverage, has got a lot of blood in it. Um, it, it, just, it just grabs people's attention in ways that are far greater than its actual significant impact. I mean, we spend so much more money than we need to spend uh, on, on this issue, uh, simply because it's captured the attention of the American people and therefore politicians, and, um, and down the trail we go. All right, Brian Jenkins, a, a, he's a, a doctor that I know, PhD, used to be at the Rand Institute, then he went to Kroll and Associates, one of the biggest uh, private investigation security firms in the world, and now he's back at uh, the Rand Institute in um, Santa Monica, California. He talks about what we're talking about here, terrorism is theater, an act played out before an audience designed to call attention of millions to a frequently unrelated to them cause or event with an attack that is crafted to create shock, outrage, and horror, and is totally without apology or remorse. Now, would there be terrorism without the media? Let me see a show of hands. How many of you think that there would still be terrorism without the media today? There was no media, because really, the media is the target of terrorism, right? Okay. So, you're right. There'd still be, I mean, even before there was a significant media uh, in um, Israel uh, during the Roman occupation, the Sakari, the terrorists, would kill with knives um, members of um, the Roman government there, Roman legionnaires there, members of the, 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 um, uh, the um, Jewish uh, leadership there, uh, kill them in the streets with this Sakari, this knife and wait there to be either pelted and killed by the mob or arrested. And that was the way that they made their point and their, their point got around without the media word of mouth. Uh, so it's an interesting thought. It's like, you know, is there a sound if a tree falls in the forest and Rusty's not there to hear it? Uh, that's a debate that's been going on for a long time. But the truth is even without the media, uh, but the media sure helps and the media is the target. Okay, the last points that I'm gonna make are some, some quick, uh, definitions and components of terrorism. Now, this is this is important. The it's not important that you remember the definitions, but it's important that you remember what are the components to make it terrorism. Because terror, you can feel terror when you know, you know, a a drug cartel or or a motorcycle gang uh, comes to town, or someone almost hits you on your bicycle or while you're running in the afternoon with a Mack truck. That, that's terror, but it's not terrorism. The thing that makes it terrorism, uh, both of them could be acts of violence, but the second point here is, is the most important thing to remember about terrorism. It's got to have a political connection, a political motive, a political goal. Then it's staged before an audience who react with um, uh, fear, fascination, revulsion, outrage, and all the other um, myriad emotions that, that people can react to when they see or experience firsthand something like this. Most important component though, remember it's gotta have a political connection to it. Okay, five definitions of terror, the Department of State, uh, you're gonna wanna immediately forget this. Uh, per, uh, 
premeditated, politically motivated violence perpetrated against non-combatant targets. I have a problem with it because, you know, terrorism, uh, terrorist attacks of other than non-combatants, who would be other than non-combatant? Well, a police officer is, is a combatant, a, a United Nations um, uh, security force is a non-combatant. When they're targeted, I would argue that it is terrorism. State Department doesn't think so. That's one of the reasons why the um, right to or the responsibility to keep track of international terrorist attacks was taken away from the State Department about 15 years ago and, uh, and moved to the National Counterterrorism Center. DOD, DOD probably has the best definition the unlawful use of threatened use of force or violence against individuals of property to coerce, intimidate governments or societies, often to achieve political, religious, or ideological objectives. Um, interestingly, they put unlawful. Now, if, if they put in there unlawful, does that mean that DOE thinks there's a thing called lawful terrorism? Do you think there's a thing called lawful terrorism? Well, I'm gonna show you lawful terrorism. And, and the United States is uh, actually one of the countries, it didn't used to be, but after 9-11, the United States moved into the arena of committing lawful terrorism. They called directed assassinations. Um, Israel is best at it, uh, but the United States and other countries in NATO, in Afghanistan, in Syria, in Iraq, in Yemen, uh, use um, um, lawful terrorism. Um, DHS definition of terrorism, uh, any activity that involves an act that is dangerous to human life or potentially destructive to critical infrastructure or key resources to intimidate and influence and so on. Now this really speaks to DHS's main role. You know, you got a director of national security, but you've also got a, got a, you know, a secretary of, of the Department of Homeland Security. Their major focus is on national infrastructure and national resources. And so this represents kind of the way they see the world. And that's the same way all these definitions are about how they see the world. The FBI's definition, very similar to the, the definition uh, of the Department of Defense. Um, not a lot of uh, the unlawful part of it, again, speaks to uh, the fact that there is lawful terrorism or state terrorism is better, a better term, state terrorism. The United Nations. Anybody know what the United Nations definition of terrorism is? If you do, just raise your hand. Anybody? No, there's a reason for that. There is no United Nations definition of terrorism. The reason is because nobody can agree on what state terror is. No state that conducts state terror or lawful terrorism is going to allow the United Nations to, to have a definition that makes them a terrorist at least not Russia and not China and not the United States, not the United Kingdom. Uh, Syria can't do anything about it and the other countries that we put on a list that says that their um, they're state um, uh, uh, sponsors of terror. Okay, I'm gonna conclude this by, um, by showing you a, a few examples of lawful state terrorism. Um, and I didn't say moral, I didn't say ethical, but it's lawful in the sense that it was conducted by the state under the cover of color of law. And that's a, that's a legal term. Um, uh, I don't have any, uh, any particular one of these that I want to point out to you other than um, uh, that's more extraordinary than any of the others. I would say that Stalin, Stalin and Lenin probably are responsible for in the great terror. You know, it's hard to know. It's somewhere between 10 and 30 million. Um, Russians are killed, um, uh, not, not by firing squads, not by uh, bullets, but uh, many of them uh, were moved to places where it was hard to live and they starved. Same thing with Mao's Great Leap Forward, the Cultural Revolution, about 35 million were killed or died in each one of those. The Great Leap Forward moved um, people from the farms, from agricultural producers into the cities, and were told to start their own individual steel making operations. The Cultural Revolution did just the opposite, took people from the factories, people from the government, and told them to go uh, into the fields and learn how agrarian uh, farmers uh, lived and try to understand how the revolution could be made better because of that. 
Why are there no simple definitions of terror? Uh, because uh, terror is so complex. Uh, there's always an easy solution to everything, a heurism, a rule of thumb, but it's only good uh, for general stuff, not, not, not really important things, complex things. Here's that Jewish terrorist I was talking to you about. Which denies the people who eat Satan, which de deprives the people of human rights of any kind. You cannot organize a mass movement against it because it will be smashed. Uh, you cannot conduct a war, you have no army. The only weapon you have is terrorism. <laughs> Okay, so uh, Marshall, that's, that's all that I'm going to do in this particular hour. I'm gonna recommend the, um, the, the video. I'm not gonna, sh I, had, I, had, I had edited a very short version of the Rickler Scorla video. But what I want uh, you folks to do is look at it on Neo, is it? Is that the name of their? Yes, it's Neo. On Neo. And if you've got any questions about it, uh, bring them back to me when we meet again on Thursday. But I show that video to every single class that I've taught on counterterrorism because it better than any other puts you into the frame of mind of what 9-11 was like for the people that experienced it directly. It puts you in the frame of mind of understanding how serious and complex terrorism is and counterterrorism operations are, how important they are, and what happens in real life terms to the people when we fail, we professionals fail at our task of preventing and disrupting uh, terrorist attacks like 9-11 represented. So I want you to look at that. If you've got any questions about that, I'll be happy to answer them on Thursday. That's it for me right now, Marsha. Rusty, thank you so much for your time. Everyone give Rusty a round of applause, guys. Thank you very much. All right. Well, Rusty, we'll be talking to you tomorrow. Actually, I'm, I'm probably going to stay. Yeah, I, you will talk to me tomorrow, but I will stay with you for the rest of the day just because I want to keep track of what's going on. That is perfect. Thank you, Rusty. You okay, guys. Um, I know we've been talking for almost two hours now, so I want to get to learn. I want you guys to learn more about each other. And then we're going to divide you up into your teams. You're going to get a bathroom break. And then we're going to go over the history of the Boko Haram. Does that make sense to everybody? Awesome. Um, and just to confirm, everybody, we're no longer sharing any screens, correct? It's, everyone's looking at everyone's face. Is that correct? Um, Thumbs Rusty up. Rusty is still sharing a screen. Okay. So Rusty.